an icon of 20th century football, an England legend, and Tottenham Hotspur's all-time leading goal scorer. Jimmy Greaves captivated fans from his debut for Chelsea in 1957 until his retirement from top-flight football in 1971, in a career that spanned 14 years, four clubs, and over 350 goals. Born in East London on the 20th of February 1940, Jimmy is said to have had a ball at his feet since he could walk. In his own words during an interview with Brian Moore, Greaves quotes, I didn't know anything other than playing football. I think it was pretty obvious from a fairly early age that I was going to be a footballer of some sort, and indeed I was. Football in the 1940s and 50s wasn't something you could watch easily on television, so as a result, Greaves never supported any specific team, but would occasionally visit White Hart Lane to watch Spurs. When he did manage to attend live matches, however, Greaves remembers one player in particular who made a big impact on his future playing style. He mentions 1950s Sunderland forward Len Shackleton as his favourite player, and goes on to say, He was my favourite because he used to do things a little bit differently from everybody else, and that's how I wanted to play the game, a little bit differently from everybody else. My main heroes were inside forwards. Ever since I started playing the game, the desire to score goals and play attacking football was there. I never ever wanted to play defensively. As one of East London's most promising young players, Jimmy had the attention of various London clubs to sign for at youth level, including West Ham United and Tottenham Hotspur. But after Jimmy and his father were approached by Chelsea scout Jimmy Thompson, the deal was done, and Greaves signed schoolboy forms for Chelsea Football Club in 1955. Two years later, at the age of only 17, Jimmy was called up to the Chelsea first team by manager Ted Drake and made his senior debut for the club in August of 1957. Ironically, against Tottenham away. In a match that resulted in a 1-1 draw, Greaves hit the ground running with a debut goal, his first of many at White Hart Lane, a stadium that would become sacred ground to Greaves later in his career. By the time Greaves was 21, he'd scored 132 goals in 169 appearances for Chelsea. In fact, Greaves was the youngest English footballer with 100 goals to his name by that age. With his attacking form on fire, Greaves caught the eye of one of the biggest teams in world football, the legendary AC Milan of Serie A. After offering a huge increase in salary, which at the time at Chelsea was £17 a week, Surely Jimmy's West London fan base couldn't blame him for swapping Chelsea Blue for the red and black of AC Milan, who were prepared to pay him at that time anywhere from £5,000 to £8,000 a year. Footballers' paychecks back in Greavesy's day were often so low that many players took second jobs during pre-season, and in this case Jimmy was no exception. In fact, in the late 1950s, he swept the terraces at Wimbledon's old ground with fellow footballer Eddie Reynolds. English football at that time had a maximum wage law, which essentially left players with no bargaining power whatsoever. But things were different in Italy. The money AC Milan were offering him was substantial enough that Jimmy would no longer have to rely on odd jobs between seasons, and before long he was airborne and bound for Milan. Although Jimmy's move to Milan was lucrative, it came with its fair share of downsides. Greaves was faced with the same kind of problems that countless players still experience today. Almost immediately after he signed for AC Milan, the manager who bought Greaves, Giespi Viani, was replaced by the tyrannical Nero Rocco. The newly appointed manager made it very, very clear that he was not a fan of the ex-Chelsea forward. Greaves felt homesick, socially out of his depth and was being ostracised from the team by Rocco. To quote Greaves in an early 90s interview, he kept telling me the wrong things. You've got to be at the training ground at 10 o'clock. Then when I get there, I'd be 15 minutes late and immediately get fined. Making me do things like go to bed in the afternoon when I knew other players weren't. I'm not placing too much of the blame on him, but things might have been different in Milan for me. In his short-lived spell for Milan, the persecuted striker still managed to score nine goals in only 12 games, which says a great deal about his ability to give his all on the pitch even when he'd rather be somewhere else entirely. Meanwhile, back in London, Jimmy's wife Irene had given birth to their first child. A lot of his motivation to sign for Milan in the first place came from a desire to provide financially for his young family. But in an oddly timed twist of fate, the maximum wage law in English football was abolished, 
affording players the right to earn as much money back home in England as Jimmy was getting in Italy. After making it clear to the top dogs at AC Milan that he was determined to return home, a bid of £99,999 was accepted by AC Milan from Tottenham Hotspur. It's been rumoured since then that the motive behind the strange fee was that Bill Nicholson, who managed Spurs at the time, didn't want Greaves to have the pressure of being English football's first £100,000 player. Jimmy was finally free from the shackles of Rocco and AC Milan, and after playing for Chelsea for £17 a week, he'd now be earning £60 a week for Spurs, which sounds like an extremely low figure in today's terms. However, in 1961... £60 was approximately the equivalent of £1,300 in 2019. Of course, that's nowhere near to the money top flight players earn today. But allowing for inflation and factoring in the cost of living in different eras, after the abolition of the maximum wage law, wages in the 1960s weren't always quite as bad as they sound. Jimmy thrilled Spurs fans and stayed at White Hart Lane for nine years, from 1961 to 1970. The 60s were the decade in which Greaves earned his rightful place in the iconography of world football, winning two FA Cups, a European Cup Winners' Cup and scoring 220 goals, a club record that to this day is yet to be broken. In his time in North London, Jimmy played with the likes of Pat Jennings, Terry Venables, Martin Chivers, Alan Mullery and Cyril Knowles and competed against the best teams that England and Europe had to offer. When England became world champions in 1966, Greaves was unlucky not to feature in the latter stages of the tournament. After a nasty injury to his shin that turned septic, Jimmy was replaced by Jeff Hurst. The cruelest blow surrounding the final must be that due to the fact that there were no substitutions allowed, that meant that Jimmy couldn't even watch from the touchline, but instead was banished to the stands along with the rest of the unselected players. However, in 2009, All squad members that were not chosen for the final were rightfully awarded with their World Cup winners' medals by FIFA. 66 was the second and last World Cup Greaves would take part in. The first being the 1962 World Cup in Chile. Although Greaves managed to grab himself a goal in the 62 World Cup against Argentina in the group stage, his most memorable moment of that tournament came in the quarter-finals against Brazil. During the game, a stray dog found its way into the stadium and onto the pitch, which of course brought the game to a complete halt. However, with the pace of the animal, nobody seemed to be able to catch it until Greaves applied a different strategy. By getting down on his hands and knees, he called the dog over and started crawling slowly towards it. Once he was close enough and he gained the dog's trust, Jimmy scooped up the dog and gave it to an official to take off the pitch. Playing for Brazil that day was an incredibly underrated player by the name of Garincha. After the match, the dog lover Garincha took the lost dog home with him to Brazil and is rumoured to have named the new pet after Greaves, calling the dog either Jimmy or Greavesy. Although he was no longer sweeping Wimbledon's terraces, Greaves did have business ventures away from football in order to prepare himself for his retirement. After a reported drop in form and falling out of favour with Spurs manager Bill Nicholson, Jimmy was dropped from the team on a regular basis. Due to the fact that Greaves was a proven talent with so much time on his hands, he was allowed to train for Spurs part-time two days a week in order to concentrate more on his business interests. However, Nicholson would grow to resent Jimmy's involvement in one particular event. To mark the opening of the 1970 World Cup in Mexico, Jimmy had agreed to take part in an international rally that would see 240 drivers race across 25 countries, covering a distance of 16,000 miles through Europe and South America, starting from London's Wembley Stadium and finishing at the Estadio Azteca in Mexico City. As one of the rally's celebrity contestants to draw a bigger crowd and more publicity for the event, Greaves was paired up with professional rally driver Tony Fall. While Jimmy was preparing for the rally, Tottenham manager Bill Nicholson dealt with Greaves mercilessly, phoning him at his house and informing him that his services at Spurs were no longer required. Nicholson wanted to sign striker Martin Peters from West Ham as his replacement but couldn't afford the £200,000 asking price. In return for a lower fee, Nicholson offered Greaves in a partial swap deal. 
By the time Nicholson phoned Greaves at his home, Martin Peters was already sitting in his office, and only one hour remained until the transfer deadline. As far as Jimmy was concerned, this came completely out of the blue, and having been given less than an hour to decide, Greaves made a snap decision that he would soon grow to regret. The last thing Greaves wanted was to leave Tottenham Hotspur, but regrettably he accepted the sudden terms, and the following Monday Greaves paid one last visit to White Hart Lane to say goodbye to all the players and staff. But when he arrived at the ground for what was supposed to be a training session, nobody was there. In anticipation of his visit, Bill Nicholson had taken the entire squad to train in a separate location. Despite such deplorable treatment from his former Spurs manager, Greaves has shown over the years what a loyal and forgiving human being he is, by speaking about Nicholson with nothing but respect and admiration. Although he was extremely hurt by the way it all turned out, it says a lot about his character that he hasn't let his feelings regarding the Spurs exit turn into bitterness. Greaves made his debut for the Hammers against Manchester City away at Main Road, on a pitch that's surely one of the muddiest and most waterlogged fields of play the game has ever seen. In traditional debut form, Jimmy got himself off the mark for his new club by scoring two goals and an impressive 5-1 victory. However, his time in Claret and Blue was short-lived. After less than two years playing for the East London side, Greaves announced his retirement from professional football at the age of 31 and spent most of the 1970s attending to his business interests with his brother-in-law. After five years away from the game, Greaves began to make a comeback in non-league football, playing part-time for Brentwood, Chelmsford City, Woodford Town, and most notably for Barnet, who at that time were playing in the Southern Premier League. After losing a yard or two off the pace he had in his prime, Greaves played a midfield role for Barnet, but still managed to finish the 1978-79 season as the club's top scorer having netted himself 27 goals for the edgeware base side. To provide a strange statistic, Jimmy was once sent off for Barnet, and in a disagreement with the referee's decision, Greaves refused to leave the pitch, which in turn resulted in the match being abandoned. Apart from the odd testimonial or charity match, Greaves hung up his boots for the last time in 1980. At this point, it's a pretty safe bet that Jimmy must have thought his best days were behind him. But as Greavesy would say, it's a funny old game, and in 1982, he began a successful career in television broadcasting and sports journalism. And in 1985, he was cast as a co-presenter of a programme that would make him even more famous than his football career, in the form of a partnership with ex-Liverpool hardman Ian St. John. Greaves and St John's first television appearance together came by the way of the 1982 League Cup final between Liverpool and Spurs. As ex-players of the two clubs, they were in studio with Brian Moore to analyse the match. However, their first regular TV appearances together took place on the popular programme World of Sport, in a segment called On the Ball. It was there that the duo's comedic chemistry became clear to see, and when World of Sport was cancelled in 1985 after a 20-year run, Jimmy and Ian were approached by ITV for a programme of their very own, which went by the name of Saint and Greavesy. Saint and Greavesy ran from 1985 to 1992 and is fondly remembered by countless football fans for providing a light-hearted insight into the latest football highlights and conducting interviews with the most notable players and managers of the moment. In an era that saw the likes of Bobby Moore, George Best, Dennis Law, Bobby Charlton, Pele, Garincha and Eusebio at the peak of their powers, Greaves managed to become a household name in his own right. But unfortunately, like all players of the 1960s, not a great deal of footage exists from Jimmy's career. Aside from a few short clips on YouTube, his legacy as a player exists through the stories of those who were fortunate enough to see him play. But if you'd really like to see some footage of Jimmy at his very best, Check out the links in the description. And for more videos like this one, be sure to subscribe.